Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Diversify Your Mindset, a 360-degree view for diversity inclusion within rental housing. It is being hosted by the National Apartment Association's Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, and is being presented as part of NAA's Residential Property Management Careers Week, July 12th through 16th. My name is James Campbell, and I'm the Senior Manager of Industry Relations with the NAA. I want to welcome all our members in attendance. Thank you for joining us for this important topic. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping points. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website and YouTube channel next week. You may then share this presentation with those colleagues and friends who are unable to attend at present. We have a lot of time at the end of today's presentation for live questions and answers. You may type your questions into either the Q&A box or the chat box on your screen, and we will share them with our presenters. Now I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to our host, John Sons. John is Director of Training and Marketing Strategies with Burlington Capital Properties. He is also an NAAEI faculty member, a member of the NAA Leadership Lyceum, and a subcommittee chair on NAA's Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. John? James, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome, um, I have to admit, one of my dear friends, Dee Wilson. Dee is the Director of Training and Social Media Marketing for Freeman Webb Incorporated. Uh, Dee started in multifamily management in 2005 after uh, assisting with the startup of the Tennessee Education Lottery. That's a very interesting fact about Dee. Um, and Dee uh, is also a certified trainer with the Association for Talent Development. She's also an NAA EI faculty member and a certified trainer through Franklin Covey. Um, Dee and I spoke before today's session and she wanted me to encourage you to feel free to ask questions as James mentioned via the chat or Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to type any comments or questions in. And as this Dee goes through her program, uh, she and I have agreed that I will politely interrupt her and bring your comments or questions to her attention. Also at the end of today's presentation, we will, as James said, have plenty of time for live Q&A. So we wanna take advantage of that. Dee's been very gracious to allow those interruptions throughout her presentation and she's allowed time at the, tent, uh, at the end of her presentation for your input because this presentation is for you. So without further ado, I'm just super excited to introduce a dear friend of mine and a fellow NAA EI faculty member, Dee Wilson. Dee, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, first, I just wanna start with saying thank you for being here. Um, I know how valuable our time is, especially in this industry. I know I never have enough of it. So um, thank you so much for taking time out. And I hope at the end of this, you get something out of it, anything out of it. Um, but what we're really looking to do today is just kind of change your mindset, um, look at different things from different views and try to figure out how you can be intentional uh, about diversity and inclusion, right? That's a word that we're hearing everywhere right now. Um, and I'm really glad. I mean, it's really, I'm glad that we are doing that. And we're going to talk about how we, we can implement that into our workplace with the people that we uh, interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is diversity and inclusion? Um, I found this great quote and I feel like it explains it perfectly. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Everyone wants to be asked to dance, right? No one wants to go to a party and stand on the side and not get any attention, not be included, right? Inclusion. So we're talking about how we can implement more of that in our workplace, in our lives. Um, and one thing that I, I, I really believe in is, you know, it's an intentional act. So you have to want to be and get better. And the fact that you're just here today shows that you do care about that. And I think that is amazing. Um, but I don't have all the answers. Um, I don't, but 
I think that when you're in a room full of like-minded individuals, uh, you can figure it out. And so uh, again, thank you for being here. Um, so just kick it off. I'm gonna kick it off with my sweet and beautiful mother. Um, I'm just showing you her picture so that you can see who created me. I'm just checking. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to start off a little bit about my mom because um, we are talking about diversity today. Uh, my mother is um, from North India, Punjab to be exact. And she came to the United States in 1981 as an immigrant. Um, when she got to America, there was a man that she didn't know that she was basically appointed to get married to. Um, so she gets here all by herself. She's in New York completely by herself in her young 20s. And she immediately goes to this man. They get married. They're living life, right? So my mom learning about America. Um, challenging, right, for anyone who is new to a country where they can't speak the language or they don't know the culture. Um, but my mom adapted to all of that. And um, one thing that we, we are going to talk about today is like a subconscious bias and assumptions and how that can really, really keep you from focusing on diversity and inclusion as you should. So um, with saying that, because um, growing up with a, an immigrant mother, a foreign mom, uh, I saw a lot of things um, happen to my mom. I saw a lot of people who took advantage of her. I saw a lot of people disrespect her. I saw a lot of things. And I'm not going to say I've never been discriminated against, okay, because I have, but it doesn't bother me like it bothers me when it happens to my mom. I think everyone can agree with that, right? We all love our mama. I hope you do. She made you. <laughs> um, so, backstory. 1981, she's here. Um, she marries this man she doesn't know. By 1985, her husband has left her um, all by herself. So now, not only is she an immigrant in this country and still learning, She's all by herself, meaning financially, uh, emotionally, no support, you know, because she has no family here. And when I was growing up and I saw these people who made these assumptions about my mom, um, just because of how she looked, uh, it made me really angry. But now, at my age, I'm kind of glad that I did experience that because it has taught me to have empathy for other people. And that's really important. If you don't have that, um, I don't think it's really something that you can like make yourself have, but I think you can be intentional about it. We can all get better if we're just intentional about it, right? So some facts about my mom that I'm gonna make sure that I throw out there because they were the, um, they were the assumptions, right, that people made about her. Um, although she was left alone at 19, uh, in 1985, um, my mother never, not one time, accepted government assistance of any kind. None. She never, ever took any money. In fact, she didn't even go after child support. And um, she worked jobs that probably many of us don't want to work and several of them and she had to depend on people and strangers to take care of us and being a mother now myself i realize how heartbreaking that is right uh, it must have been really hard for my mom um but she's a trooper and she did it and she's so strong and she um raised me and my sister and in 1994 uh, my mom became a legitimate citizen of the U.S. And she did that by going to classes, getting her GED, learning about the history of America. I can remember being a young girl and actually sitting in the living room with my mom um, and going over like the presidents of the United States. 
um, teaching my mom as a child, you know, helping her, but she did. She wanted to learn and she did. So I hope right now, if you are looking at my mom, you've had some type of mindset change, right? Maybe it's, um, you know, wow, that's a really, really strong woman. Or maybe it's like, wow, I feel really, really bad for her. But whatever it is, now you know her story, right? So maybe that's the problem is we don't know everyone's story. But now we need to be intentional about learning about other people, um, about adding that diversity into our lives and into our workplaces. So let's kick it off. Um, first, I'm going to talk about your applicants, right? I'm going to talk about your applicants because in property management, they are important. Your prospects are important. Um, you never put anything before one of your prospects or your residents. You don't answer the phone before them. You don't finish a conversation before them. So when we think about diversity and inclusion, we want to talk about some of the, um, the subconscious bias that we have. And I call it subconscious because when it's, a, when it's a bias, it's just something that you favor more than the other, right? It doesn't mean that like, you're prejudiced. It doesn't mean that you're discriminating against someone. It is our natural selection in what feels most comfortable. I found this amazing article um, and it led me to a, um, a study that Harvard did. Um, it ended in 2015, um, but it, it's a test. The test is still available online if anyone's interested in taking it. Um, it's a very interesting test, very interesting. Um, and from that, they learn about um, your subconscious bias. So as you can see, um, we're looking at 28% um, of people, and oh, I make sure I explain that this was a study that was done over years. 2004 to 2015. I wish I could find something more current. Um, but as you see, 28%, the majority, uh, preferred light skin compared to dark skin. And at the very bottom, you have um, a strong automatic preference for dark skin compared to light skin, and that's 2%. And if you're going to uh, compare that to the 28%, at the moderate level, um, people who preferred dark skin to light skin was about 5%, right? Uh, terrible numbers, but again, these are the subconscious bias that we have. We're not doing them on purpose. So we're going to talk about how we're going to be intentional about that today. If you don't know what to focus on, and if you don't know what you want to change, it's never going to happen, right? So one of the biggest things that we can do as um, as companies, management companies, leadership roles, um, is be, sorry, <laughs> being committed to that. Um, so when you are uh, looking for applicants, your, your prospects that are coming in, um, your, the people that you are hiring, especially, you want to be aware of that bias that you might have, um, that you might pass someone up because, you know, oh, this person is Gen Z and this person is, you know, a millennial and I don't really care for Gen Z or I don't really care for millennials and making decisions that way, you know, or by color or anything like that because you favor it. And when you favor that and you pick based on what you're more comfortable with, um, you're, you're doing like a culture ad, right? Um, where you're basically, you are, you're focusing on getting people into your office, into your management company who fit, right? Um, it's not a culture fit. You want to think about it as a culture ad. I understand, you know, especially when you work in a smaller office, it's very important that, you know, the office people get along. Um, they, you know, are able to work together successfully. They help each other. They care about each other. Um, so most of the time, you know, how you're doing that is 
you're taking a look at this person and you're looking at their personality and you're saying, um, well, that person I think would get along better with our staff. That person would probably get along better with our residents. Uh, that person would probably get along better with our employees because it's something you're comfortable with, right? Um, so that's a culture add and not a culture fit. What you want to try to focus on or be intentional about is how do you do the culture add? Sometimes that means going against your subconscious bias. How do you know though? You have to be intentional about it. Uh, job descriptions. That's another thing that you can do to um, help in diversity and inclusion. Um, you want to uh, use specific words. You want to leave specific words out. Um, things like um, uh, visionary or fun, that sort of thing works really well. Saying, instead of saying like man or woman, now um, you can it's prefer to maybe just say person, right? Um, that's very important in who you get walking in your door. So depending on what your job description says, uh, is going to, it's going to, that's going to bring in those applicants who read your job, job description and feel comfortable in the fact that they could do it. Um, not someone who feels like they would be excluded from it. So when you are hiring and you're in the hiring process, make sure that you think about your, your, um, your job, your descriptions, excuse me, and how you can make that um, more diverse and how you can make sure that you are um, including that diversity and you're including people at your property um, to help you with that, you know? Uh, it's okay to say, hey, you know, we're hiring for this maintenance technician, you know, what are some things that I should, I should think about when I'm talking about someone, you know? Um, maybe, maybe it's not gonna be so geared towards men uh, in the sense that you are using a lot of masculine words. Um, there is a, um, there's a company that actually will help you write your job descriptions to make sure that they um, enhance your culture of diversity and inclusion, and they let people know about that, and they'll let you know what, which words to use, not to use. Um, that's very interesting. <laughs> company branding. Uh, this past uh, year, we actually did a complete rebrand of my company, uh, Freeman Web, which I love very much. Uh, and during that process, I learned a lot, a lot. One of those were your brand. Um, what is your brand? That's what you're known as, right? Your brand is um, statements. Your brands are value. Your brand is something that you get um, all of your new employees and all of your current employees to buy into. So you want to think about what your company branding says about you. Um, when you look at your website, when you look at the words that you use in your uh, brand statements, the value that you carry as a company, um, and you're intentional about that. You're intentional about the words that you use in your statement value. And with, with that being said and doing this branding this past year, I learned how important that was and how it can take a lot of time to figure out what those correct statements are. But if you're not intentional about it, then you basically show that you just don't care, right? If you don't actually think about it and you want to make sure anyone and everyone who read your statement would feel comfortable at your company. And if you want more employees and you want people to work for you, that's definitely what you want. So definitely think about your brand values. Moving on now to your peers. Um, I uh, have been very, very, very blessed to work with some wonderful people. Um, people who um, have encouraged me, pushed me, um, mentioned my name in rooms. And um, I definitely don't think that I would be where I'm at today if it wasn't for my peers. Um, my peers that believed in me 
and made sure that when there was an opportunity, they mentioned my name. So with that being said, there was a lot of things that doors that opened up for me and a lot of more opportunities that I received because of that. Um, I am on the board of the uh, Greater Nashville Apartment Association. Um, so I did run to become a board member once and I did not win, which is fine. You don't always win the first time, right? Um, but I did have, you know, some hesitation about potentially doing it again, hurting my ego a little bit more. <laughs> um, but that, that year uh, that I was not on the board, they were in a situation where they had one drop off. They had a board member drop off and they had to be replaced. Um, so when they were having this discussion and the people in the room that were having this discussion, um, one of those people um, is one of our past chairs. Her name is Stephanie Burns. Um, she is an amazing woman. But the thing is, is at that point, we didn't have the relationship that we have today. Um, you know, I didn't like love her as a friend. Uh, I liked her a lot. And, you know, I didn't know whether she liked me or not. Um, but the thing is, is she got to know me. I think she got to know me and she listened to me. And I, I think she believed in, I, well, I know she believed in me. And so when we were, when they were having that discussion, she was someone who threw out my name and only because she did that, and I truly believe only because my name was thrown out, <laughs> that I, um, I was accepted and I received a board position. Now, the following year, I did have to run again for my position and I did win. So we're all good there. Um, I love my association. I love my board, the people that are on the board with me. Um, we do have diversity. Uh, we do have really important conversations. Um, and Stephanie Burns is still a really big part of that. And um, I still look up to her a lot and hopefully we'll be as successful as she is one day. Um, addis additionally, when we talk about, you know, mentioning someone's name in a room and the opportunities that you receive, um, Susan Sherfield and John Sons has, they have really supported me in my, um, in my progress with NAA. Um, I became, you know, NAAEI. Um, there were things, certain, you know, facilitating opportunities uh, that they threw my name out for. Um, and I'm aware of that and I'm very appreciative of those people as well, uh, especially Susan who has given me so many opportunities to get in front of people and help me along the way. She has definitely made a huge impact on my life. So think about that. Think about the impact that you make on someone if all you do is notice their strengths and get to know them and mention their names, right? Aside from that, how can you make sure that you are changing your mindset when it comes to your peers? When you are talking about your employees that you have, how do you listen to everybody, right? If you make a decision, how do you actually listen to everyone? One way that you can start is just by having a simple committee. If you have a committee um, and you have diversity in that committee, you can have discussions about things that you want to implement, um, that you want to services, right? Services that you want to you want to implement, you know, different softwares. And you can you can get their perception on it. You know, they every everyone looks at everything a little bit different, especially based on their experience. So when you include your employees um, and your team members, they are going to trust you more because you care about them or you listen to them. If I know that someone actually cared about me and my feelings and they were taking that into consideration, I would definitely trust that person more than the person who didn't care what I had to say, right? I think we can all agree on that. Uh, additionally, engaged employees are going to go much, much further for you, right? Uh, you want your employees to be as engaged as possible, but you can't get that unless you have that trust. You can't get that unless you are including them, right? You want to make sure that 
in situations where you're asking for advice, you actually see it through. And, you know, you maybe give, um, you, you know, show everybody or tell everybody who that person was who came up with this great idea and ask everyone, like not just from your corporate office, ask from the top to the bottom. You know, everyone has great ideas. Everyone thinks a little bit differently and having that, that diversity is going to help uh, your company, your properties. Uh, it's going to help your teams. It's going to help your employees. Uh, and people are going to want to go further for you when they know that you care and they care and you care about diversity and you care about including me in decisions. And um, that's something that uh, additionally, I think my company does very well. Uh, we really take into consideration our team members and what is important to them and how we can get better. And we don't know how to do that unless they tell us, right? But we have to act. And we have our leaders. So when you are in a leadership role, especially, um, it's very important that you are thinking about diversity and inclusion. So different, there are different things, different biases that we have. But, more, you know, again, some of the most discriminated groups, of course, are, um, you know, LGBTQ, transgenders. Uh, people are discriminated because their race, their religion, ethnicity, um, generation, right? Generation. Um, if you are a leader who makes these um, assumptions or you have this subconscious bias about a specific generation because of just how, just because of that, that's your thought, right? That I believe that, you know, growing up as a millennial, I feel like everyone hated us. And I'm sure other millennials think about that too. Um, but growing up as a, as a millennial, you know, I think sometimes, you know, people didn't take me seriously because I think a lot of people didn't take millennials seriously. And each generation tends to have their own reputation and um, we had ours, but you can't count someone out because of their generation, right? You can't, you can't discount someone because of their race. You can't discount someone because of their gender. How are you going to discount someone or not think about someone just because of their sexual orientation? What does that matter to you, right? It doesn't. That is someone's personal life, but it's something that we should be intentional about. And if those people don't know that we care, they're not gonna be engaged. They're not gonna be great um, employees and team members. It starts at the top. And um, you wanna think about what your leadership looks like. I don't just mean a picture, right? I mean, what does your leadership look like? Do you guys take other um, team members thoughts and opinions and consideration? Do you talk to your employees? Do you visit them? Um, do you listen to them? Do you ask for their opinion? Um, I had a manager one time who, when we were sitting in a meeting, she told me about something that, um, something that was happening. She told, she, she told our whole team about something that was happening. And I guess my, my immediate response to that was, oh, like, I didn't know that that was happening. Like, no one told us. And she told me, she was just like, well, I don't have to tell you about decisions that I make. And I was like, okay, fair enough. You're the property manager. I get it. But um, I didn't feel the way I did for her, the way I had a manager who, even if it didn't matter, he would sit us down and he would always ask our opinions. And um, yeah my personal friend, Zach Ward, um, was very intentional always about um, bringing his team in and asking them questions. You know, what do you think about this? How does this look? When there was something that he wasn't strong at, he admitted it. And 
that is a great leader. Someone who can say, um, is, or is humble enough to admit that they don't know how to do something. A lot of people who are in leadership roles don't wanna do that. They don't want to look like they don't know how to do something. Instead of saying, hey, I don't know how to do that, teach me. And guess what? That person is gonna feel amazing that they got to show you something. That's including someone, right? Effective collaboration. It's very important that when you are um, you're making changes or anything that you have effective collaboration. And what that means is you actually, you actually follow through with things, right? You don't ask people about questions, you know, ask them about these changes that we're gonna make and we're not gonna have them. You think about sharing your personal weaknesses. Um, I think that's very important. I think it's very important, um, especially as a leader, uh, to be humble enough to tell someone, you know, I failed at that one time too. I didn't pass that. I, you know, I didn't. I didn't pass that the first time I took it. I, um, you know, I didn't get selected for the board the first time. And you tell people that because you're setting that example for them that it's okay. Like I'm, I'm opening up. And I'm. I'm letting you know that it's okay sometimes to fall, to fail, because I've been there and I've done that, but they see where you are now and they know that they could potentially overcome that as well. Hopefully giving them some hope, sharing your personal experiences um, in general with um, your teams and your employees, um, I think is gonna be really important I think it's going to be really important that you have cultural intelligence and that is just specifically learning and being intentional about other cultures and other things that they do. You know, I know like with my mom, you would never walk into her house with your shoes on ever. <laughs> That's never do that. Uh, but it's just taking that extra step to learn about someone when there's an opportunity that arises or something that happens you know, it's okay to say, well, what is that? Tell me about that. You know, what does that mean in your culture? Um, having that visible commitment to change is going to be really important. Um, having that visible commitment is hearing someone say something and actually, you know, stepping in and saying, well, that might not be the case or being aware of your subconscious bias and saying, well, generally I would go this route, but maybe this person would have some good ideas. Let, let's go that route. Um, you're making, you have a commitment to diversity and inclusion. And when you do, it becomes a lot more important to your team members. Uh, you have to care before they care. They're not gonna buy in if you don't, um, you know, amazing teams, you know, if, if they have, a, they're effective, they have effective collaboration, they think about things together, um, they learn how to solve problems together. Um, I know, you know, that's something that I always, I always um, encourage people to do, especially in our industry, uh, for the uh, office team and the maintenance team. Um, I always say, teach each other, right? Learn from each other. Um, you know, why would they care about learning about, you know, leasing or why would they care about learning about maintenance? Because when we do and we learn and we are committed to learning about that person, their feelings, what's important to them, we can help them. We can be better at our job. Um, additionally, someone knowing that you care um, is going to make them feel a lot more comfortable in the decisions that you make. Moving on now to your residents, because we all have, right, um, a lot of different residents that live in our community. Um, when it comes to your residents, you, the biggest thing that you can do is just be um, emotionally intelligent. So EI, emotional intelligence is something that I don't know if it can be taught, but I think that you can be intentional about that as well. Um, emotional intelligence 
is going to help when you're in situations where maybe there's a cultural difference or you notice um, that someone doesn't feel comfortable doing something. Um, learning about your residents and you know, learning about um, their emotions and how they feel about this. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe because we're having this breakfast on the go um, and we have a lot of Muslim residents here, maybe we shouldn't just get sausage biscuits, right? Maybe we should think about, you know, those residents and how they might feel. How do you leave people out, right? Um, do you accidentally say things that maybe make someone feel uncomfortable and they wouldn't want to attend uh, an event that you had or your community? Um, I think the lack of inclusion can result in high turnover. Anytime someone feels like they are not respected or cared about, they don't generally stay there very long. Especially with your residents, you know, we, we are dealing with people's homes. So I don't know how there's anything that could be really be more important than that. Um, so when there are specifics, there are things that maybe um, is a cultural change. And of course, right, that's something that I always hear is people go, well, you're in America. So, um, you know, you do things this way or do things that way. And they don't want to conform to someone else's culture. That's not inclusion. So when you hear someone make a comment about, oh, well, I don't want to take my shoes off when I do this, or I don't want to, you know, do that. You have to understand that then you're making your residents uncomfortable because you lack inclusion. You don't want to learn more or you don't care about someone else's culture. Um, and that will get you nowhere, <laughs> but will also lead to very high turnover. Someone is going to stay at a community where they feel like someone cares about them. Um, cultural differences, understanding and learning um, that some people or some, you know, yeah, excuse me, cultures, maybe they don't shake hands with women. Um, maybe, you know, they eat at a certain time or maybe they pray at a certain time. And there's all these differences between the cultures, especially at your community. Do you appreciate that? culture difference. Do you take that into consideration, right? If you, um, when you're having resident events or when you're making any changes to your community, do you think about the cultural differences in how you make your residents feel? Um, for instance, when they come in and, you know, maybe their, their English is a little broken. Instead of being so impatient with someone, maybe think about the fact that, you know, they're making the attempt and they can speak two languages. Can you? <laughs> think about how that may not be easy for them and how uncomfortable they might feel when trying to explain something to you, especially when you're not being patient with them. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> that you know, there are not situations where you need a translator or something like that. Um, I firmly believe if someone um, you know, has an, an issue with English or maybe doesn't understand it completely or read it completely, um, they definitely shouldn't be signing any legal documents, especially not your lease. It's not fair, especially when you know that someone is not gonna understand everything the lease says. Encourage them in those situations, encourage them and care about them enough to say, you know, is there anyone, you know, who can translate this for you or um, actually take the time to go through it with them? Um, that's respect, right? And that's respecting other cultures. Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of getting angry about it, learn about it, right? Um, if there are certain things that your residents do and you don't understand why they're doing that, Instead of just sending them a violation letter, maybe ask them. Maybe there's a different way that they can do this. Maybe they can still do this and enjoy this, but be over here, right? How do we make that compromise so that they still feel comfortable? 
How do we not make people uncomfortable? As long as we're intentional about it, I think it shows we care. It's just trying, it's effort. Uh, and the LGBTQ community, where you have someone at your community or in your company who is part of that group. And uh, that's someone who probably um, gets discriminated against a lot. And uh, that's probably very hard for them. So instead of having this bias, right, this subconscious bias of, you know, I prefer someone who's straight over this, or I prefer someone who doesn't want to, you know, change their gender over someone who does. Instead of that, you know, consider that person. Think about how they might feel every day, making the choice that they make and, you know, people discriminating them against it. You know, it's not because I'm open about it or because I'm making my life decision, people are mean to me or people don't pick me or they don't think I'm smart enough. There was a time where I had um, a resident or someone who applied and as we were applying, we were going through the whole thing. Um, you know, she was a she. She was definitely a she, completely. She, everything about her was very feminine. Um, we got along really well. <laughs> um, we talked about a lot of things and, and during the, um, during the process of you know her becoming a resident so at one point in time she gives me her id and i notice that on her id she's a man right so in that situation i'm immediately first i'm surprised because i didn't realize that at all second i immediately thought oh, wow, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now that I know this? You're going to treat her the exact same way, right? You're going to take a copy of that ID and you're going to put that in the file or you're going to do whatever you do with the ID when you're touring and you're going to treat that person how they want to be treated. You wouldn't look at someone's ID and assume or just automatically just start calling them Mr. because you see that legally they're listed as a male Consider that person and maybe instead of, you know, instead of, you know, not understanding or having a bias or making assumptions about, you know, people who are in this community, um, especially, especially transgender people, um, empathy is going to take you a very long way. And anything that we talked about today, if you don't have empathy, um, you're never going to make a change. You will never be able to have um, a, a diversity and inclusion in your leadership, training, in your teams. They're not going to believe in it, right? Um, so when, you, when we're talking about someone, especially who's a transgender, think about instead of how you feel. I feel uncomfortable or I feel this way or I, I feel, you know, this way about a bathroom and this, that, and the other. Not going to get political, but... Have you ever sat and thought about the turmoil that that person has gone through in their life? Uh, if you're not part of that group, imagine growing up, spending your whole life being one sex and then inside of you, it doesn't feel right. Nothing about it feels right. And when you think about it that way, hopefully, you look at transgenders as some people who are strong, people who have really dealt with a lot. It's not easy. It's not easy to do that and then live in a world where people are mean to you and exclude you and they don't want you to live at their property. They don't want you to work at their company because of that. Um, I think last year alone, they... Um, Last year alone, companies that, that focused on diversity and inclusion, they were committed to it, they had training. Um, they saw that those companies had um, a 35% increase in profit than other companies did. 
people are going to feel a lot more comfortable when they know that they are cared for and someone cares about them. Um, again, there's so many different ways that this can happen. Uh, race, ethnicity, um, generation. Instead of not liking a generation, think about what they could bring to the table and how they can help you. Um, you know, because again, millennials had a terrible reputation, um, but we're not all the same. Um, and instead of, you know, beating down the next generation, we can lift them up. You know, I'm completely, I completely believe that this next generation is going to change our world. I think they already are. And that's why we're sitting here today talking about diversity and inclusion. I am at my time, but last thing that I want to mention is your suppliers. Think about your suppliers and who's on your community. Think about your suppliers and do they care about diversity and inclusion? If you care about it, don't you want to make sure that the people that you work with and use, they care about it too? Hopefully you do. Thank you guys so much for um, spending time with me today and letting me um, speak and listen to me and listening to my ums because I'm sure I said that like a thousand times. Um, but don't judge me. I'm nervous. Um, I think we're going to open it up now to um, any questions, anything that someone might want to talk about. Yeah, the, <clears throat> you know, thank you. Thank you for doing this today. I, I think you brought up, well, I know you brought up a lot of great points. Um, you know, there is that uh, unconscious and subconscious bias that exists out there, no matter how, how hard you try to avoid it or maybe overlook it or whatnot. I think we're all a little guilty of that. <clears throat> and it's something that we need to talk about. And I appreciate you, you talking about it. You know, I see that we've got a lot of people in the room here and I, I know that you've, you, you have, you have said several things that have impacted people that are participating in this webinar. And I really want to encourage the folks that are here. Um, you know, do you have any comments or do you have a question? Please feel free to, to type that into the chat feature right now. We'll share those with Dee. Dee did wrap up in time that we could take a few minutes to, to talk about those things that impacted you during today's webinar, during her presentation, or maybe some things that you have some questions about. You know, I, I'm going to ask a question, Dee, I, 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 and, and some others may have the same question. I see one coming up right now, and I'll mention it in a second. But... Uh, maybe to get some some folks asking some more questions. You know, I've struggled with this. I've had other people that struggled this, with this when it comes to hiring or when it comes to asking people to join a committee or uh, doing other things. You know, we're we're taught, and, and I'm a, you know me, you know me personally, uh, and someone's color or sexual orientation or whatnot doesn't bother me. I, I love everybody equally. But sometimes we have to think about including those people of other cultures or other sexual orientations. And sometimes we're afraid to cross that line because it's like, well, I've never really been biased, but now I need to be to make sure I'm including people. How do you balance that thought process? Because I've had that conversation with a lot of people recently. Um, honestly, one thing that you can do that I know that a lot of companies do now, um, and you know, I've seen my own you know, community that I've been at, we've done this before as well. Um, are you include, include your other employees in the interview process, have them there as well. Um, because when it's just you sitting with someone, it's, it's everything that you're perceiving from that person. And then you might have a second or a third person in the room with you that says, no, I didn't get that from them or no, I don't, I don't think that's what they were saying or encourage you to cross that line, maybe encourage you to say, man, I think this person would be great for our community because, you know, I think they would really get along with they, or our residents would probably feel comfortable and um, they would see that there's, you know, someone different in our office. Now, and I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that you should just be hiring people because of their sexual orientation or their race. Um, I am not saying that. I am a millennial and I see a lot of people who have a terrible work ethic. And as a millennial, I don't have that. Um, but I don't want to be discounted for it either. Right? Yep. 
Okay, well, great. You know, we do have some questions coming in here. I'm going to, and some comments. So I'm going to start uh, shooting those off to you. And we're going to be respectful of time. Um, uh, one here said, I love the comment about culture ad rather than culture fit. I too, I have to say uh, that I love that comment. That was a different perspective and something to really think about. Um, another a comment here, we started a diversity committee at work, but are having a hard time getting people to participate. Any ideas to help increase participation? They had a great class, thank you. Um, I guess it depends on, you know, how big the pool is that you're pulling from. You know, I, I think, especially, you know, when, when you're thinking about your company and succeeding, um, you want to look at the people who have the talent, who work hard, you know, um, the people who deserve to be there. Um, but are, is it something that maybe you're, you're making important? Is it something that everyone knows about that you're doing? Um, if it's your, you know, in, if it's your entire company, is it something that um, you're promoting and you're welcoming them and you're, you know, putting them on your, on your Facebook page or your Instagram page? Um, I guess my question would be is how are you promoting it? Secondly, if you're having people who are hesitant about joining, there's probably already a trust issue. So something that my company does quite often um, is maybe try a survey, you know, try a survey um, where someone doesn't have to put their name on it so you can get some real feedback. Once you know that, once you know why, you know, or how someone might feel uncomfortable or what they do or don't like about your company, um, I think it would give you a better perspective on what you can do to include them or try to get them to want to be included in that committee. You know, you bring up a great point. I'm a big fan of anonymous surveys. You learn a lot. I know SurveyMonkey, you can do anonymous surveys. There's other, there's other survey tools out there, but I'm a huge fan of anonymous surveys because you really do learn a, a lot. Um, if, if folks are certain that that's an anonymous survey, they're gonna open up to you and share, you, share with you the information that you're looking for. Uh, and that helps build that trust that you were talking about. So that's a great yeah. idea. Uh, there's another comment in here. I'm really proud of Dee for this presentation. I will echo that. Uh, I knew she was the right person for that. And this person also says, you were the perfect person to share this information. And Dee, I, I personally can't thank you enough. I was super excited uh, when we asked you to do this. And I'm even more excited today because I think you knocked it out of the park. You shared a lot of great information and it wasn't just, it's not just about the information that you share, but it's the ideas people get from that. And it's the thought process that start creating that if you weren't thinking about these things before today's uh, presentation, maybe you'll leave today's presentation thinking about those and thinking about those in the ways that you should. So Dee, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you for those that have, have stayed on and asked questions and provided the comments. And with that, James, I think it's time to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much once more to our presenter, Dee Wilson, and to our host, John Sons, for this excellent webinar. For more information, NAA maintains an online portal, Diversity and Inclusion. The URL is featured below. Next slide, please. Uh, the online portal directs viewers to such NAA resources as the Diversity Leadership Program. The Innovation in Diversity and Inclusion Grant, the application for this grant, by the way, is fast approaching July 31st. There's the Diversity and Inclusion Award. There's the Alex Jack Q Diversity and Inclusion Sponsorship Scholarship, and this application deadline also is fast approaching July 31st. There are webinars, there are courses, there are articles, and there are best practices. And as mentioned earlier, past webinars are hosted on NAA's YouTube channel, so you can look for things there as well. So again, I want to thank everyone for participating. We absolutely value your membership and appreciate your attendance. So to all, have a great afternoon.